running the IPC Bangladesh program, but I will start with a talk on India, and this afternoon we'll talk more about Bangladesh. Uh, so I, I'll, uh, so 40 minutes is short for uh, presenting an academic paper. Uh, we are used to taking much longer and getting into that. And so the way I thought I'd deal with the fact that I have very little time for one paper is I decided that I'll present three papers in this morning. <laughs> Uh, no, so so the idea is I'm going to, so there's a research agenda that Mark Rosenzweig, my colleague at Yale, and I'm building on uh, understanding uh, how people manage risk and deal with risk in uh, rural areas. So this is a series of papers on insurance. We'll start with the question that drives a lot of my research agenda is why are people not buying insurance? And my agenda, a lot of my research agenda is about why is it that we cannot get people in developing countries to adopt product behaviors, technologies, that we think are good for them, that are apparently beneficial, but somehow when you try to market it, people are not so interested in, in taking it up. Okay, so we'll start with the sort of colleagues of insurance or lack of insurance, and then I will talk about two other papers where we discuss the implications of having or not having insurance. Uh, so by way of background, uh, so formal insurance markets are largely asset where they are most needed, which is agrarian areas, rural agrarian areas, where people are very, very subject to shocks and risks. So price shocks, um, weather shocks, including rainfall shocks, and we'll talk a lot about rainfall insurance today. Um, and most of the world's poor live in agrarian areas. Uh, most of the variation in income year to year comes from variation in rainfall. It's, it's just weather dependent. It's something beyond your control. So you're exposed to a lot of risk. And most people don't have insurance. Right? And this is puzzling because if you, um, if you, if, if there was some event that affected the majority of, of the fluctuation in your earnings year to year, you would really want to be insured against that. And when we try to sell insurance, and we've tried it in Africa, we've tried it in India, when we try to sell insurance, people don't seem all that interested in purchasing. Right? And there are many different reasons for this, probably, you know, the liquidity issues, the trust issues. Um, and the, the, the area the, that I'll focus on today as to why people don't do this is the idea that sometimes there are informal markets that already perform the same function. So in this case, informal risk sharing networks. And this is the main reason we're doing the project in India, apart from the fact that it's a large informal country, is that you can identify those informal risk sharing networks very well. People are born into them, jati, jati so the sub cash networks. So that's how, and so since it can be identified very well, we can start saying some rigorous things about when you are in a certain type of cast that provides a certain type of indemnification, how does that mediate your demand for formal insurance? Uh, and so there's a lot of uh, literature that suggests that informal restraining networks are very, very important. Um, and um, so, and, and this evidence has come from lots of places in the world, from South Asia, from Thailand, from, uh, from Africa. Um, it, the the restraining networks protect against idiosyncratic risk, for sure. Uh, so which is, so by idiosyncratic risk, I, I mean things like, in my family, I have a health shock. Yeah, I have a death or I have an illness, and then I expect other people in my community, other people in my jati, to come and help me out. With the understanding that if they have a shock in the future, I'll help them out. So that's how the network works. Now, jati that you span not only uh, villages in India, but also even districts and sometimes even states. Right? And now if the jati is, is spanning a large geographic area, then there's also a possibility that they actually provide you some insurance against aggregate risk. Right? If, if they were just in, a, in one village, then rainfall risk would be hard to insure that way. But given that they're spread across, and you don't need a direct link to somebody in a different state. So if you have a link with somebody who has a link with somebody in another state, that's the way you would informally identify against aggregate shocks. Okay. Um, we also know that while these informal risk sharing networks exist, uh, the amount of insurance provided by them is incomplete. People are not fully insured. Okay. And this is partly why we, are, we have to be very um, uh, careful and interested about how do we expand um, uh, formal insurance markets. And the, the other reason we're interested is while the informal risk sharing networks are very important, they're necessary, we understand why they exist, why the caste system exists, and why it was uh, important for us to organize our lives this way. It is also the case that in a, in a modern market where you have formal mechanisms available, there might be a cost of continuing to rely on the system. And that cost would be, for example, if you're all in a network, right, 
when I suddenly get rich, and there's an expectation that I share resources, that kind of acts as a tax on any savings or investment decisions that I might make. Because if I save, if I invest, if I have good ideas and I get richer, there's going to be an expectation that I share with others. Okay? So there is, there are, you know, it's performed an important function, but there are potential costs. So it's worthwhile for us to think about can, you know, you know when a modernizing economy, can we get people to start formally insuring so that uh, investment saving decisions, these things can be much easier to make. Okay? And, um, and now, you know, for the session, the link between informal insurance and formal insurance. Uh, so there's some old results from 20 years ago by Joe Stiglitz and Richard Arnott um, that suggest that informal insurance can actually drive out formal insurance, even more value in sense. And how is that? So if I'm in an informal insurance network and my network is allowing me to take on very, a lot of risk, then formal insurance companies may not be interested in that area. Right? They're going to worry about people taking on too much risk. Okay. And that's the way in which this model works. That the insurance company is prevented from coming in and offering products because they'll make losses when people are taking on too much risk as a result of informal informal networks. Okay. Um, so, so here's some some of the reasons that people are not buying insurance that have been mentioned in literature. Uh, trust issues. You're in an environment where it's very difficult to enforce long-term contracts, and so there might be fraud. Um, and also this moral hazard and adverse selection, which is you sell insurance and people take on too much risk, and that undermines the market. And it also, you also adverse selection is where you uh, uh, encourage the wrong types, the risky types, to come and buy insurance. Now, to address these moral hazard, adverse selection issues, uh, something that's become very popular in the developing world, as well as the developed world, he says, is index-based insurance. And the idea here is you break the link between the specific action a particular person can, an insurer can take, say a farmer can take, and the payment. Okay? So, so the, the, the problem with traditional insurance is you sell insurance to a farmer, you insure their crop, and as soon as they have insurance, then they have not as much incentive to make sure that the crop succeeds. Because now you have insurance, you get a payout, you're not going to put in much effort. Right? And that's the problem. And the way to mitigate the mod hazard data selection problem is to offer a contract like this. Okay, I'm going to measure rainfall. I know you care about that because the amount of rainfall affects the crop output on your farm. Okay. And only if rainfall is low, I will make a payout to you, and therefore you get you get help in the period when you need it. However, I know that you cannot control the rainfall, so I don't have to actually have to observe any of your actions to figure out whether the pain occurs. Okay. And this way, you, you're not going to put in less effort, the insurer is not going to put in less effort, because they cannot possibly affect the propensity for uh, the monsoon to arrive. So that's the key problem it solves. It solves this adverse selection model as a tech problem. Okay. And uh, on a practical level, uh, and I've had to think about this more since I'm now selling, I'm an insurance salesman in India, it also is much uh, cheaper for, for us to implement because we don't have to go around farm to farm to farm and actually try and actually verify whether or not uh, whether or not a loss has occurred. You just measure rainfall at a rainfall station. Okay. So there are multiple ways in which this, this works better. However, it introduces some new problem. You can't get something for, for nothing. And the new problem is, so imagine that I'm measuring rainfall right here. I have a rainfall station and all of your farms are on the chairs where you're sitting. You don't actually care about rainfall right here, the contract that I'm offering. You care about rainfall where you're sitting. Okay. So sometimes you might have a problem where it rains um, an adequate amount here, right? But you face a drought. Okay. And and that's a pretty big problem. And this is this is what, what's known as basis risk that I have in red over there. Uh, this is a pretty big problem because now I might have made your worst outcome even worse, which is that you're facing a drought, you need help, you've paid premiums to me, you've purchased insurance, and I'm not making a payout. Okay? So the worst outcome is not worse because in the bad state of the world, you're not getting help and you've made a payment to me. Okay? Um, and, even for, so, and even for index insurance, uh, other studies in India have shown that the demand is very low. It's very difficult to get people to purchase it. Okay, so uh, in this setting, uh, the way we're trying to make some progress in this use agenda is to actually go out and sell insurance. So we partner with AICI, which whose head office is in Delhi, and 
they uh, we designed a contract for them, which they have then marketed and uh, underwritten by themselves. Okay. Um, and uh, the we, we wanted you know one of the uh, key hypotheses in the literature was insurance contracts are very complicated. You have to talk to farmers about you know if rainfall is less than X millimeters, you get a payout. Less than Y millimeters, you get a bigger payout. Um, and people, people are not with, you know, uh, used to thinking about millimeters uh, far, you know, and, and, and that kind of scares farmers away. And so we decided to just design the contract in a very simple way. We just said, okay, we're going to look at the monsoon onset date. Okay? If it's delayed by 10 days, by 15 days, you'll get payouts. If it's delayed by 30 days, you get a bigger payout. It's very, it's, you know, ultimately, of course, we have to measure millimeters of rainfall, but uh, yeah, from a marketing perspective, it's, it's much easier for us to. Uh, 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 for, for us as a market farmer. And another benefit is that, given that it's for the onset date, uh, you can make payouts much earlier. And one of the reasons why farmers may not be buying insurance is they're getting payouts during harvest time when they don't really need money. The marginal value. Yeah, you to define uh, one of the contracts. Yes, I'll, 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 I'll do that. Yeah, um, it's coming in a, in a future slide. Um, okay, and so we take this contract and we market it in three states, in Uttar Pradesh, uh, AP, and Tamil Nadu, uh, Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu. Um, so we go out and uh, so randomly vary insurance offers and insurance prices to about 5,100 cultivators in these, in, in these villages, about 60 villages in these three states. And for the first time in, in an insurance program, we also marketed insurance to the landless agricultural laborers. And a lot of what we learned today, that I'll talk about today, has to do with demand for insurance among the landless and how it interacts and general equivalent effects in the labor market between the landed and the landless. Okay. And why is this important? Uh, it is very puzzling to me that, or to both me and, and Mark, that insurance has not been marketed to the landless. So in general, in India, uh, the exclusive focus has been on the landed. But of course, the landless, their livelihoods are, if, if anything, even more intricately tied to rainfall outcomes. You know, if rainfall is bad, there is no work to do. And so they, they face a lot of rainfall risk, and it, it's curious that we have not been you know, selling insurance to the people who probably need that product the most. Um, and uh, we, we look at the Jati uh, as, as this risk sharing network. And what is another thing that's unusual about this project relative to, say, other randomized experiments we've seen and including one yesterday, is, is that um, we were lucky there that in these, in the, in the villages where we do our work, uh, for the last 40 years, uh, there's been a survey going on, the Rural Economic Development Survey, done by NCAER. And uh, so we have a lot of very rich historical data on all of these households, on all of the people so the, their the historical data on the extent of risk sharing, the kind of gifts, transfers, loans that are flowing back and forth, okay? and the history of shocks that these villages face. Okay? And so we were able to go in and market insurance exactly in those areas. And what's unusual about this is that now this allows us to study the marketing of formal insurance, this experiment, okay, and relate it to very rich information about the types of networks that uh, that these people participate in. Okay. So we're able to combine an experiment with the old traditional style of, of doing research that's based on much, much richer and long-term data. Okay. Can, I ask, can I ask a question? Sure. So this whole thing is designed in the factory. But of course, you know, uh, there's going to be some uh, administrative costs, and so farmers would not be interested in the product, and I'll show you they are interested. Okay. And, yeah. and also one more follow-up, the rate should be different. So for example, you know, Andy Foster has some work showing that in regions where there's excessive deforestation, that will affect the rainfall patterns. Yes, so the rate, yeah, uh, of course, so the rate should be based on historical data measured at that rainfall and station. That yeah, of course. I mean, that's how, yeah, you, uh, so, but the rate can only be different to the extent that you have different rainfall stations. Right? It can vary at the rainfall station level. Uh, okay, we different. We actually go in. Um, it turned turned out that in some areas there weren't rain, uh, rainfall gauges available, so we went in and built our own rainfall station, and uh, and also randomly varied how close it was to the village. So in some cases we did the standard thing, which is to put it at the block level. In other cases we went into the village and put it at the village level. And the reason that was important is now instead of the rainfall gauge being out here, where all of you are out there. I put it right in the middle of the village, and so that's going to have much better correlation with your individual outcomes. Okay. So that creates some random variation in the extent of basis risk faced by farmers, 
okay? And that allows us to study how basic risk of mediates of the macro insurance and how important it is. Uh, so here's the here's the example. Okay, so uh, so the number okay, so basically there's going to be different triggers for uh, for payouts. The first trigger pays out 300 rupees per unit, rolled up to 750, rolled up to 1200, and depend and and and, uh, and of course this varies by village. Right? Um, and so uh, in some villages, if it's 15 days delayed, you get the 300 rupee payout. In other villages, it's 20 days delayed. Right? Um, and then so you can have villages where there's 20, 30, 40 days delayed with these payouts, and other villages where there are 15, 20. These are units. Uh, these are per unit. So of course you, you don't need to, now that you're selling index insurance, you don't need to sell it on an acre basis. Okay. Uh, so, so given that it's index insurance, actually you could buy it, or Nadia sitting in Brandeis could buy it as well. Okay. Uh, so it's, 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 it's not that different from a lottery. Okay. So what's the cost of the insurance? How much cost? <laughs> but people could buy as many units as they wanted. Uh, so in some cases we have farmers buying 20 units if they're large farmers and they want to insure a lot. Um, and so if the rate, it's on, the pricing, the premium, I computed it based on their historical data. Based on the local weather station. Exactly. Process. Yeah, the closest weather station that they had access to. Okay. And, and uh, given that they did, did not have a uh, 115 rupees applied to the first one? Oh, uh, no, so it's one insurance contract, so you pay 118 rupees, and in exchange, you get a payout of 0, 300, 750, or 1200. Okay. That's, that's our case. Okay, so the quest, the research questions I'll try to address here. Uh, so the first one is the demand for insurance. Uh, so first, how does the presence of risk sharing networks and the extent of risk sharing as well as the nature of risk sharing, whether it's covering idiosyncratic risk versus aggregate risk, how does it all affect uh, your demand for formal insurance? Okay. And how, how does basis risk affect the demand for formal insurance? And it turns out in theory, it's not just a simple story of Oh, if I am well informally insured, I will buy less formal insurance. Right? When you introduce basis risk, the environment becomes a lot richer and the theory becomes a lot more nuanced. Okay? And I'll understand that. So that's the first question. So after we go through demand, then the second question I'll ask, and this is why, this is my attempt to link it to the growth and the growth conference, is whether insurance allows people to take more risks. Okay? Because we care about insurance, of course, it's welfare enhancing because it allows people to manage a smooth consumption manager risk. But if you're interested in growth as IBC is, we also want to be able to determine whether or not insurance allows people to switch away from low risk, low return to high risk, high return technologies that ultimately leads to growth. Okay. So we'll establish that second. And third, we, I will get into uh, more detail about this landed, landless uh, debate. So why is it that we are not selling insurance to the landless and what the cost might be? So it turns out that if you only go and market insurance, that market insurance only to landed cultivator households and leave the landless out of it, as it's currently done, then giving insurance to the landed makes the landless worse off, or has a possibility of making the landless worse off. In our data, it does. They are actually subject, exposed to even more risk. Right? And the simple intuition is, you sell insurance to to the landed, right? that induces them to take more risk, and I'll show a number two. And when they take more risk, I'll show you that their demand for harvest labor becomes a lot more volatile. It becomes a lot more rainfall dependent, and therefore the risk environment faced by agricultural wage laborers are going to be a lot more volatile. Okay, okay so uh, one, one thing I should mention here is that in a previous IDC conference, uh, Mark had presented this paper. Okay. So I'm going to go relatively quickly over this. Uh, without and, and, and the general approach I'll take with all of these results is I'm going to try and present them without showing you a single regression result. So I took the, the IDC uh, direction very seriously and, and tried to make it uh, so that both policy and researchers have something. Okay. And in this case, I'll, I'll even show you everything non-parametrically without any okay. um, and, the, and let me, without, I, I don't want to get into too much detail about the research design, but let me just tell you what, what kind of variation we're using for the data. It's, it's a randomized experiment, so the variation is relatively good. Uh, and uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll just have this one kind of methodology slide. So first, for uh, we have this design randomized variation in index insurance offers from this randomized control trial we ran. Right? And therefore, when we study, say, the effect of insurance on risk taking, we have close to you know, we have what 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 we what we could think of as the gold standard variation, which is that we have some people who randomly have more access to insurance, others 
to randomly have that accident insurance. So if you study their risk taking, we can very cleanly answer the question. Does insurance allow people, index insurance allow people to take more risk? And we can further answer the question, does it allow people to take more risk when they're already informally insured by their tasks? And then to, under, to look at the effect of basis risk on the propensity to purchase insurance, we've you know, randomly varied the location of the rainfall gauges. So there also we have very nice variation, which is that some people got insurance contracts with low basis risk, others, others got insurance contracts with high basis risk. So we have both standard type variation there as well. And finally, the risk sharing networks. So this is the case where it's difficult for us to randomly assign how much risk sharing people are born with and, uh, and, and how much they enjoy it over the course of their life. And the nice thing about the variation in the, in, in the informal risk sharing, and this is the, the very nice feature of doing the work in India, methodologically the very nice feature of doing the work in India, is that people are born into these networks. So you're born into a past, uh, you cannot leave. There is huge penalties on intermarriage, Right. And in fact, that's how you make a risk sharing network function well. Because if you didn't do that, then the people who uh, who did well, they would leave, leaving all the losers behind who could, could not really share risk very well by themselves. Right. And and so, given that there is strict penalties, uh, or it's not possible for you to enter and exit, right, this is an endogenous feature of, of, of life as you know, people are born into. It's not like these networks that are endogenously forming. Right. Um, and, and we can measure, uh, the, uh, the, given the historical data we have, we can measure the nature and the extent of informal risk sharing for every person, given the caste identity that they have. Okay, and how do we do this? Uh, we use data on aggregate shocks, so village level rainfall, historically in these villages. We use data on idiosyncratic shocks, so we know for each household, for say, the 10 years prior, uh, uh, before we come in and sell insurance, whether they face illness, death, theft, other types of, sort of individual test jobs, crop laws, etc. Okay. Uh, and we also know the gifts and transfers given and received. Right? So we basically measure the extent of informal sharing by regressing uh, the health that they get as a function of idiosyncratic shocks and as a function of? This is more by the household? By the household. Uh, as a function of idiosyncratic trucks as well as uh, uh, as a function of their aggregate trucks. And not only do we do it, know it by the household, we actually know it for the census of households in these villages. Right? So we, we can characterize the restraint network completely. Um, and so it turns out that one, once we do this analysis, some tasks, some jatis are very good at identifying aggregate risk. So for example, if they have more occupational diversification or geographic diversification, this is why the census data is important. Right? So if there's lots of non-farmers in the cast, right, then they can actually identify advanced rainfall risk. If everybody's a farmer living in the same village, they can pick them up to that. So that's one source of variation that becomes really important to get variation in aggregate risk identification. And then uh, there are other types of tasks uh, where there's a lot of presence in a village, so they can, they can directly monitor you and sort of control moral hazard. Right? They are very good at identifying against idiosyncratic risk. Okay? So we now have, for every task, we have a parameter for how well uh, idiosyncratic risk, risk is covered and how well aggregate risk is covered. Okay? And so we can look at the effect of both of these parameters on the demand for the formal insurance. Okay? Um, so the first thing I wanted to show you is that it is actually possible for Japanese to cover aggregate risk. So this is the correlation in our in our uh, sample, uh, where on the x-axis I plotted the uh, uh, inter-village distance, so distance between any two pairs of villages, and on the y-axis I plotted the their rainfall correlation. Okay, so so the median distance between villages and our even within a state in our in our sample is is somewhere around here, and and so the the correlation actually goes down pretty quickly. So it's not you know some people think that. When the monsoon arrives in India, it arrives everywhere all at once. And that's, that's this graph is showing you that that's not true. And the second thing I'll show you is that there's actually a lot of variation in rainfall to insure against during a period. So this is from 1999 to 2006. This is roughly just 10 years before we actually done any sold insurance. But there's huge variation in the amount of rainfall that, that occurs in, in these two states during that period. Okay. And third, this is the amount of variation that occurred in the year that we sold uh, rainfall insurance, and these are different states in total. These are different states in Andhra Pradesh. Okay, so this is the amount of uh, 
between all the different villages, and the red bars are where we made payouts. But yeah. I, I, I thought you were. The contract was about how many days or exactly. Uh, how, um, yes. So, th so this graph tells you that that's true, right? Because the contract was not based on this graph. The contract was based on days, and you see that where rainfall is very, very low, that's where you're getting higher payout, the 1,200 rupee payout or the 700 rupee. So, you know, and then when rainfall is relatively low, uh, that's where you're getting 300 rupee payout. But it also points out, this graph also points out what you're talking about. So in Chandravi, rainfall was very low, but the rainfall arrived on time. Okay, so ultimately it was very low. And these guys did not get a payout. Okay. So this contract that we had, Right. So there was a trade-off. As I said earlier, we wanted to make it very simple so farmers would not get scared away from it. And so we had to make it about onset days. But farmers care not only about the date on which the rainfall arrives, they care about also about the total amount of rainfall. They in fact care about the timing of the rainfall pattern. So for example, it's really bad for farmers if the rainfall arrives on time, and then there's a first rainfall, and so that makes them confident enough to plant, right? and then it disappears. Right? That's worse than the rainfall not arriving on time because they would not have made that investment. Because you first need the soil to get moist before you can plant. Right? So, so of course, there are many different dimensions that matter, but if we try to design a rainfall insurance contract that said, you know, here's the nonlinear pattern that you should care about, and I'm going to make payouts like this, farmers like, you know, you're, you're trying to make a fool of me, I'm not going to get to that. Okay, so, uh, so in, in, so let me, let me uh, give you one slide of words on the theoretical model for the demand paper. Um, so I'm not going to do much justice to this. But the first thing I'll tell you, so what, you know, here's, here's the setup. So we take the Stiglitz, Ar Arnold Stiglitz model of informal risk sharing, where, and then we, we put in a model of index insurance on top of that. We put, we combine the two. Okay? And when you do this, the first thing you learn is that if your CAS provides you coverage against aggregate risk, that will substitute away from formal insurance event. Because if both the CAS and the formal insurance contract are trying to indemnify against the same risk, these two things act as substitutes. However, if the CAS provides you uh, very good informal, uh, uh, sorry, very good idiosyncratic risk coverage, like coverage against death or tests or, or, or illness, then that does not actually affect the demand for rainfall insurance in theory. Right? And the reason is there are two different risks being uh, uh, being covered by, uh, you know, being covered by the two different contracts, yeah. So, clarifying question, uh, Anand's figures is about moral hazard, yeah. so what if admission of moral hazard? Um, okay, so, that, yeah, uh, Arnold's figures is about moral hazard, but um, in, you know, when we talk about index insurance and its effects, right, uh, there is no moral hazard in there, because it's a rainfall insurance contract, so, so in our case, when we go to the data, we actually don't need to observe moral hazard given the implications from the theory that we're testing. You could take crop choices and whatever. Oh, oh right, right. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about, yeah, we will have data on crop choices. We'll have data on not only crop choices, actually a much better measure. Uh, we, we, I'll show you crop choices, but I'll show you a much better measure, which is how correlated is your, how sensitive is your output to rainfall? So that tells you about the broad range of decisions you might have made that led to more sensitivity of rainfall. I'll show you that as well. So we'll have all of that data and we'll use this post insurance and measure the obvious thing. Just a warning we're yeah. running okay. So okay. Um, okay. So okay, so let me let me uh, let, let me move uh, let me move quickly. Uh, uh, so let me defer all questions till we end then. If that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so first Okay, so one type of risk sharing leads to uh, less insurance demand. The other type of risk sharing is independent. Okay. Now we introduce basis risk into our insurance contract. And the first result is when you have more basis risk, people are going to like that insurance contract less. They're going to buy it less because it's an inferior contract. Okay. And the third thing, this is the most interesting thing that came out of the theory that I have not thought about before. It's that when you have ins index insurance with basis risk, this type of contract I'm describing where the rainfall gauge is out there and you guys are all up here, right? that's when informal risk sharing and demand for index insurance becomes complements. So if you have more informal risk sharing, that actually allows you to purchase more index insurance. And why is that? Okay. So think about the case where the worst case scenario I talked about. Okay. So you face the drought, you're facing a bad situation, right? and I measured rainfall here, there was no drought here, and I'm not making a payout. So you really need help during these periods. That's when, if you have friends around who see that you are uh, facing a really bad situation, they can help you out, right? So you get help exactly when you need it, 
and that allow that makes the insurance contract with rate systems less bad. Right? It it uh, mitigates the bad features of, uh, of of the index insurance contract, and so they become customers. Okay, and we can test that in the data, and we find that as well. Um, okay, I uh, just talked about that. Okay, uh, so the first result I'll show you uh, uh, from, from the data is that in our sample basis risk exists. So this is, here I'm plotting uh, rainfall on the x-axis and output. Uh, so we collect a lot of detailed data on uh, agricultural revenues and costs and so forth. So I'm plotting the revenue side on the y-axis. Okay. So this, these are the uh, villages I have, the blue line as a set of villages I have where I have um, uh, where I've placed the weather station in the village. Right? And when, when I'm measuring rainfall from the weather station in the village, there's this nice positive relationship between rainfall and output as you would expect. Right? But when the rainfall station is placed outside the village, rainfall measure and output is much flatter. Right? So rainfall does not predict output as well. So it turns so so that suggests that when rainfall is measured out there, it does not predict your output very well. When it's measured in there, it predicts your output very well. So that's one way to think about this. Uh, second, uh, I'll go over this quickly. You know, this experiment worked when we offered subsidies to insurance. People bought more of it. That was true across states. That was true across all price levels. Yeah. Um, okay, and then this is the this is the uh, interaction result between basis risk and index insurance, or uh, basis risk and reducing value risk sharing. Okay. So when there is when you don't have any informal risk sharing, so your past is very bad at providing. Uh, informal risk sharing for idiosyncratic trust, right? That's when uh, when uh, basis risk goes up, so the distance to the nearest rainfall station goes up, okay? the demand for insurance falls, right? But when you have good informal risk sharing from your past, then when basis risk goes up, your demand for insurance actually rises, right? People who, uh, uh, people who, you know, this is where, you know, if you have, this is the case where you have a lot of basis risk, it's not a very good contract, you're worried about the fact that you won't get payouts, but your CAF members will help you out during that period. Okay. Um, okay, and then the third result is that when we also can measure you know, how well your CAF indemnifies you against aggregate risk. Okay. And if, so this is what it looks like with uh, idiosyncratic risk. With more basis risk, we have more demand, but with aggregate risk, regardless of the amount of basis risk, if, you, if your CAS is already doing that job well, if the insurance contract is meant to do, then you don't buy insurance. Okay, so uh, now let me quickly tell you about risk taking. So this is what Moitish was asking about earlier. Um, now, hopefully, you know, in order to get broke, we get more risk taking with insurance. We want to test that in the data. Right? Now, Arnold's biggest claim that for informal risk sharing can actually lower risk taking. And the reason is you have your CAS members who are around you like who will have to make payouts if you fail, right? So they're there controlling your behavior, right? and and so we'll and, and so in the theory, index insurance can allow farmers to take more risk even in the presence of informal risk sharing. Okay? And so let's look at look at that in the in the data. So this summary measure I talked about earlier. Okay? Uh, one measure we use is that we should see if people are taking more risk, we should see that output is becomes more and more sensitive to rainfall. That's going to be a nice measure of all of the actions that people might take uh, that, that we can characterize with risk. And then the other thing that we can look at that Moitri talked about was the changes in seed varieties and whether or not we're shifting away towards high risk, high return types of seeds. Okay, um, okay so here's, uh, here's the non parametric results on that. Okay. If you're offered rainfall insurance, this is, this is the red, red line. If you're offered rainfall insurance, then there is this very nice, uh, uh, you know, so this is, this is increased sensitivity. So I'm plotting on the x-axis rainfall per day and on the y-axis the, uh, uh, the amount of output. Okay. So if you're offered rainfall insurance, then the relationship becomes very sensitive, meaning that people are making decisions such that their output is dependent on rainfall. Exactly what you think is, so basically what happens is over here, with low, with, with a drought, this is a drought situation, I have low output, but I don't care too much about it because I'm going to get a payout. Okay? And so that allowed me to take more risk. Without rainfall insurance, the relationship is much flatter. Okay? And second, uh, in Tamil Nadu, we had you know, many, many different varieties of rice planted, and I've got all the farmers to rate. Okay, rate each of the varieties that you plant as either good for 
uh, drought tolerance or good for high yields, etc. Right? And so then I could identify the exact seeds that the farmers thought were high, risk, high return versus low risk low return. And when I'm offering, so blue lines are offered rainfall insurance. So when you offer rainfall insurance, you switch away to, from crops with good drought tolerance and switch into crops characterized with having as, as being good for yield. So people are directly switching technologies in order to take more risk when you're providing an insurance. Okay, okay finally, weather insurance on the landless. So I promised you that this is where I think we have the sort of most clear policy recommendation of how the market of insurance either to the landless or the landless leads to changes in labor supply, labor demand, okay? and, and, and changes in labor. Okay. Um, so when you offer rainfall insurance to cultivating households, in, in the theory, uh, Overall, it increases the amount of labor hired because they're now investing more. And if that investment is profitable, we should see a lot more harvest coming up. Right? However, it also increases the sensitivity of labor demand to rainfall. And so cultivators are going to be passing on some of that risk. Okay? And if you offer insurance to wage workers, it reduces wage volatility, but it increases. You know, and how, how does it uh, reduce wage volatility? Farmers are going to make labor supply decisions, migration decisions, in order to self-insure, and those decisions will be affected by the presence of insurance. So for example, during a drought, farmers actually migrate out to cities even during the tariff season. They, they will no longer need to do that once they have insurance. Okay. And so that's how the labor supply curve shifts around. And this increases profit volatility for, for the cultivators. So actually this might, you know, if we were to look for a Chicago-style explanation for why the government is not selling rainfall insurance to, uh, to the landless, you know, we have an explanation for it here, which is that if the landless get insurance, farmers are actually a little bit worse off. They face a little bit more volatility. Okay, okay so here's uh, what happens to um, uh, labor demand. Okay, uh, so the, the, the green line is the set of farmers offered rainfall insurance. The red line are people randomly not offered rainfall insurance. And look at their demand for hardest labor when there's more and more rainfall. Okay. The people who are offered rainfall insurance, I showed you earlier that they were taking more risk. And now this graph shows you that not only are they taking more risk, that is resulting in more or less harvest demand, so labor demand. So the labor demand becomes much more volatile, much more rainfall dependent on this. Okay. Um, and uh, another prediction from theory is if farm, if the landless people understand this, that when a lot of cultivators are offered insurance, they are going to they're going to be much worse off. Then if they understand this well enough. Then when we go in in, a, in the village and randomly offer more insurance contracts to cultivators, then the landless should start demanding more rainfall insurance as well, right? Because they know that I'm going to be in a much riskier environment now. Right? And that's exactly what we find in the data. Okay? So the landless are 12 percentage points more likely to purchase insurance of all cultivating households in the village or offer an insurance product rather than taking money. So this is pretty, I mean, pretty sophisticated decision making, uh, uh, you know, even in the insurance demand. Okay. So I'll end here. Uh, so the first re first result from the um, from the demand study is that informal networks will lower the demand for formal insurance only if the informal network is already performing that same function, which is covering aggregate risk, indemnifying against aggregate risk, not, but not when they're indemnifying against idiosyncratic risk. Okay. In fact, when they're identifying as idiosyncratic risk and the formal insurance carries basic risk, that becomes a complement to formal insurance. Okay. Um, and formal insurance assists farmers in taking more risk even in the presence of informal risk sharing. So that's, so I think, you know, the fact that this paper is on the program is related to growth, which is nice. Okay. And um, landless, and the final thing, this is the clearest policy method. I think landless, you know, we should recognize the fact that landless laborers' livelihoods are weather dependent, even more weather dependent. Right? And they actually also um, exhibit a very strong demand for rainfall insurance. So one result I have not mentioned is, you know, we, we sold rainfall insurance to cultivators, we sold it to landless laborers. Uh, there was no significant difference in the demand between the two groups, and in fact, if you control for income, landless laborers have even stronger demand for rainfall insurance than landed right? So if you're going to re sell rainfall insurance or start a program, I think it's worthwhile thinking through how can we sell it to the landless. Okay. I suspect where this uh, policy comes from is the fact that, you know, it's from British common law that people ought to have uh, an insurable interest in order to buy insurance. Otherwise, you might worry that somebody sitting in New Haven might want to gamble I might have a lot of
So uh, we have a uh, discussion. Arvind is going to uh, discuss the paper and then we'll throw it open for questions. We will eat into a little bit of product set. Is that uh, much more consumer than <laughs> everybody about it? Yeah. Uh, Arvind is my colleague. He's the uh, economic advisor in the Ministry of Finance. So thank you for being this. I will give some of my views which are mostly relevant from policy point of view. And I must admit up front that I'm not an expert in the uh, financial. And uh, so my comment should be based a bit more in the question that brought uh, <coughs> up in the discussion that we have, you know, uh, which is likely to come up. So to begin with, I must also say that uh, it's an interesting paper and has rightly pointed out right in the beginning that the uh, Despite being highly susceptible to fluctuation in the weather condition, the penetration of the farmer in Germany is low. There can be various reasons for that. And uh, uh, um, it is certainly among those dependent on low, uh, uh, among those who are dependent on taking culture for their livelihood. In India, the government has announced some uh, insurance uh, schemes, and despite these penetration happens to be low. There could be various reasons for that, both on the demand as well as on the supply side. I'm not going to the details, but you know, uh, certainly for the demand side, poverty, etc., could be on the reasons and you know, information based on all kinds. So, uh, uh, what is interesting in the paper is also the very few studies. First of all, very few studies I have come across. Uh, uh, we've gone, gone, uh, we've gone into the micro aspects of what many consider essentially a more educative kind of. Uh, uh, we would have considered more of this at educate level. Uh, so that's an interesting part. And we are also bringing in the task of the Guardian and the Traffic Court. Uh, so very few uh, uh, studies would be really considered in that aspect. So that's the novelty of the studies. So, uh, so that's the good uh, thing. There are few points uh, that uh, uh, I would like to, uh, to start with of more of a clarificatory kind of point which you have mentioned on page 10 of your paper. You might refer to it later on. So I'll just quote that one line. The rainfall insurance, if of which some of the barriers to adoption can be overcome, however, allows the farmers to increase the risk taking. I would like to know what kind of barriers you are talking about. And, uh, uh, are these cash barriers or are there some other barriers? Mm -hmm. That's what one. So that's more of a clarification which I write from, from the paper itself. So the other issues uh, that I have in mind is that is the risk taking behavior the same or different in the different states that we have? Uh, because it was not very clear from the paper where uh, uh, and you consider that aspect. But from the presentation, it seems that uh, you have considered that aspect. But I would like you to throw more light on that issue. Uh, okay. It is different. What kind of differences are there? Why are there differences? Uh, I think those are some of the things which should have come out. Then, in the informal arrangement, reciprocity, reciprocity becomes important you know, in the sense that uh, if uh, 
If I have a problem, I come to you. If you have a problem, you should be able to come to me. So that sort of thing is important. Is that you have taken into account those kinds of possibilities and, and uh, it could be important particularly from, for small farmers and uh, more so among the agricultural laborers. So, uh, what sort of, what's your reaction to this particular point? I think it is possible to elaborate a bit on that. It's also when uh, some of the cars, particularly the scheduled cars, have higher levels of poverty than other other uh, sub segments of society. Since the states that are being considered in the study have relatively low lower proportion of scheduled tribe population. Mm. Because scheduled tribes and scheduled cars also are so this is likely to have an, you know, it could have an impact on the risk taking capabilities of uh, the this, this uh, the different segment. So and also there could be a possibility of uh, the risk the risk uh, mitigating behavior could be different. So I think uh, whether your study has considered this aspect particularly, and can it be replicated to other states where the scheduled type population would be liable? So I think if you could throw light on some of these issues, we could be safe. Thank you very much. Should we connect a few questions and then maybe uh, have a go at sure. uh, questions? Okay, so I'm just trying to understand this mission, which is why I'm just going on and on about it. I, I hope that's okay. So this the serial correlation in, in rainfall. Okay. So suppose I'm a farmer and I'm I'm aware of the fact that there is serial correlation in rainfall. So in this season, the rain is late by 15 to 20 days, and so my payout is 150 or whatever. Okay. I know that next year the rainfall has uh, a pretty high likelihood of being late again. Okay, and so I am going to get, I know today that next year I am going to get some payout. Why would that not change my behavior in terms of you know, crop planting choices or whatever that is? Because I, I'm, I'm confident that this is going to happen. That's, that's one thing. I'm just trying to understand this. The second thing that um, I wanted to ask about was this Jati thing. Um, so, you know, Mark has a paper from the 80s talking about the fact that uh, you know, you treat this this jati and the distance things as an exogenous variable, but people marry uh, at long distances for insurance purposes, right? So there's some endogeneity uh, in in that aspect. Um, and I'm just, so, how, you know, to put your feelings on that. We'll go this side and then come back to say. Uh, this is very interesting, but uh, I, I would like to ask about the mechanism. Uh, how how people get insurance uh, within, within their jatis. And so one thing, uh, particularly like whether the land here is then fed or not, and Simon Anderson had that paper about uh, irrigation markets in UP uh, in 2007, where they found, uh, where he, he found that like people in the same same caste networks, they are more likely to provide access to people from their own caste network. So, so that would be good to know. Thanks. I want to know, maybe if you can just share some, just share some light on the facts. I mean, uh, in fact, the people who are getting that kind of insurance, I mean, these uh, farmers, so whether they are going for more risk taking crops, like uh, they are going for cash crops or something like that. And uh, one more fact is, um, in fact, who are these farmers actually? Um, the land holding of these farmers. I mean, the people who are having much more land, they are going for much more risk or is there any kind of relation between that fact? Uh, <clears throat> some insurance, but you started your presentation by asking why, you know, the puzzle about why there is more of it. Uh, 
So, I, you know, I'm sort of reinforcing this with such Dave's question here. So what are we learning from your study about that? So there are a bunch of hypotheses about why you do not see a lot of informal returns. And I guess you've touched on two of them. One is informal resharing. And the sense I'm getting from your results is that that's not really uh, likely to be important because it's the Arnold Stiglitz offset effect arises if informal networks cover aggregate risk. And presumably they don't, but you know we don't have a clear understanding of how much aggregate risk the informal networks provide. The second is basis risk. I mean, you look from your plots and there is a substantial amount of basis risk. I mean, the difference between your your weather stations seem pretty right on, and you know the the, the regular rainfall stations seem pretty flat. So it seems there is a lot of basis risk. Uh, but uh, you design your product based not on your own weather stations, but on historical data. So that suggests that the basis risk wasn't all that important because you provided insurance and it had the, the required take up and you know adoption and risky choices and all of that. So if that is the case, why haven't commercial companies entered and provided this kind of insurance before? So there would be, I guess, all the other possible explanations, you know, trust, fraud, income liquidity, all the hyperbolic discounting, all of those kinds of issues. Um, private insurance uh, premium, that may actually be a cheaper way to uh, deal with this problem as opposed to massive the Can I go, can I import that? Uh, Maybe tricky to do that, but you could do some kind of different type of places that you offer and then offer and see how it could actually went up because of all this mistaking. The other question is, uh, did you guys uh, break even on the insurance? Uh, and this connected to, I think, the last point. If you guys did, then why are people offering it? Another big group of researchers, uh, Sean Cole, Robert Towns, and others, doing work with rainfall insurance, and I just wanted you to comment on how your work relates to this. Cover everything, sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm already going to confuse myself. But so let me start with the very first point. Uh, I'll start with the discussion point and the very first point that uh, Mr. Avinda made that relates to uh, uh, his comment. Yeah. Uh, so it is true that if you look at, and, and hope, okay, maybe I can use that as a way to also uh, uh, talk about uh, Sean and uh, Rob's work as well. Uh, so if you look at the channel literature on insurance, there's a lot of different hypotheses out there. Okay? And let me uh, be clear about what they are, because I've covered one particular uh, aspect of the problem, but this is not this, this is not necessarily, or uh, anything in our report doesn't necessarily say that these other things are not important. Okay? Uh, liquidity issues is something that Sean and uh, Rob's paper points out, right? that people think are very important. And so we have microcredit working very well, but think about the microcredit contract where you go in and offer a loan to people in the hope that they will pay back, right? So, uh, so the trust and fraud and moral hazard issues are all on the part of the well, of the borrower. The, the bank is taking on a lot of risk. In insurance, is exactly the opposite, right? Which is you go in and ask people for money, and they have to hope that you'll be around to pay off when. Uh, when, when the money is required. And that makes it much more difficult for poor borrowers, especially because they don't feel like they have as much, uh, they have access to strong institutions that can help them recover, uh, recover the loan, especially in an uncertain environment where, you know, somebody is measuring rainfall somewhere, you know, and they talk about these millimeter stuff, I don't understand it. Okay? Well, they can just, even if, even if it's not outright fraud, they can just fool me. Okay? So these things, I think, are very important. Now, uh, in other work, I'm, I'm doing work in, uh, on insurance in Bangladesh as well, in other work, I've used uh, a little bit of a trick to get around this issue, and the trick is to follow, uh, and I don't know why insurance companies have not done this before, which is, if, if it really is the case that people are worried about fraud and they're, you know, and maybe I won't get payouts in the future, you can easily turn this around and say, okay, yeah, here's another insurance contract I'll propose. I'll give you some money, okay? If good things happen, you need to pay me back. If bad things happen, you don't need to pay me back anymore. Right? One could easily, and, and that also has the same features of insurance, and you get get around this problem. So I've done this for migration in Bangladesh, where I was trying, you know, people were risk averse and were worried about taking the risk of migration, and I offered this kind of an insurance contract here: take a take money for a bus ticket. If good things happen, you need to, you know, take ten dollars. Good things happen, pay me back fifteen dollars. Okay, with the insurance premium. If bad things happen, you can pay me back five dollars. 
right? And that's worked very, very well. So I was able to get um, even more people interested in migrating them than in a standard credit contract where it was $10 per month. Right? What about, uh, just, uh, just uh, on a follow up on that, yeah. what about uh, in, in a, a credit contract having an insurance company? Yes. Does that work and why does it work? Okay. So, so one, uh, I think in theory that's a great idea, which is that farmers, in, in order for investment decisions, are both constrained because they don't have loans, they don't have money to invest in a new technology, but they might also be worried about risk. So you might think that locking this together is definitely feasible, right? Um, uh, get get them to do it more. So in Malawi, Dean Yang and uh, Xavi Jine, who's also a co-author on this uh, good job work that you pointed out, they tried this in Malawi, and they found that when you offer people credit, versus when you offer people credit with insurance, offering them insurance actually lowers the take up of the credit. So, so people are really worried about taking insurance. So they don't want to pay anything for insurance. Um, so insurance, you know, so that's why, uh, okay, so given that set of results from Gujarat that you pointed out and from, uh, from Malawi, right, that's why when I sold insurance in this opposite, you know, in this other way in Bangladesh, the fact that I got lots of take up was really uh, kind of stunning to me. Right? So in general, the, the, the setting we're in right now is that if people are very reluctant, people are very worried about buying insurance. Okay? And, and I think, you know, so all these issues, trust, fraud, liquidity, the fact that the contract is complicated, right? They're, they're all potentially important. Now, it's really, and, and these other studies have looked at that, these, um, it's really difficult to actually make, uh, has been very difficult to make a lot of rigorous progress on this. Okay? So for example, with the trust issue, uh, in, uh, in Sean and uh, Rob and others' papers, they, what they do is they send an NGO representative along with uh, the insurance marketer, right? In some villages and other villages, they don't send that NGO representative. And they, and they find not much of an effect of that. But also, even if you do find an effect, it's like two people marketing rather than one. So it could be something else going on as well. Right? Uh, it's, it's been very difficult for us to do going about it. Now, I would not, okay, so overall. In New York, you got both data. Look yeah, like yeah, 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 it got like 40%. What is it that you did here? Subs that subsidies. Okay, so, so you asked about subsidies. And this was, this was one, you know, let me answer that question as well. So, in, in, because I wanted to study the effect of insurance on risk taking on another downstream outcomes. And so I needed to get good take up, right? And so I heavily subsidized the contract and the subsidies are the single most important determinant of take up. That's why I asked you accurately fair and you said yes. But oh yeah, yeah. So, so, right, sorry. So, so the, the design in the numbers I put out, 300, 750, 1200, those are actually fair numbers. So the, and, and, and people aren't, and, and, and then what I did was I went in with a little basket and people could put their hand in and, and get red, green, yellow cards, etc. And they got subsidies on that actually fair price. That's, that's what you do. Okay. So subsidies are an important determinant. You know, if you if you want people to buy insurance, if you offer it at lower prices, then that's... But you could repeat it next season, right? There's not been enough time that you could repeat reducing the subsidy. Ah, okay. Okay. okay, good. So there's, um, yeah, so we are actually doing it right now. We're going back and selling insurance again this year. Okay. And one of the results that's come out from China in an insurance study is if you if you sold insurance to um, to a set of to a set of people and then you go back and repeat it the second year, the people who got a payoff in the first year, they're very likely to buy it again in the second year. <laughs> and if they did not get a payoff, they're not as likely. And the same result, my colleague Chris Yu, Greedy, and Carlin have gotten and done. Okay? So experience with insurance actually matters. So I think. Part of it is that you actually need to build a market, make people feel comfortable that you're actually going to come back and make payouts. You should report the extent of subsidy. Oh yeah, yeah, no, it's all in the paper. So, it, it, you know, and, and in fact, um, in yeah. uh, I'll, I'll just put it up so you can look at exactly the amount of subsidies. I wasn't trying to hide it. There we go. He did it very fast. <laughs> yeah. so, so, so the extent of subsidy, you know, so this is zero percent subsidy, ten percent, fifty, and seventy-five percent, and that's those are the percentage of people taking up insurance. So as I, as I mentioned, uh, subsidies leads to more take up across states, across uh, occupations, both for landless and for cultivators. Um, yeah, so no, no, nothing was hidden. Yeah. In fact, this is the most colorful slide that I've ever seen. Okay. The question of the Jati, yes. the cluster yes. of questions. Jati, okay. Um, Yes, okay, so one, one question for me is, so what is it that about scheduled tasks and scheduled price? 
So it turns out that one important determinant uh, for the extent of insurance that the jati provides is actually the level of income of the jati. Okay? So, so you know, the way I look at the extent of insurance that the jati provides is how well your jati members are responding to um, shocks, uh, like how, how well they're giving in grants and loans when you face droughts or you face pests and death, etc. Right? If the jati is on average richer, they respond much better. So those are the metrics. So I think, therefore, scheduled cash, scheduled price uh, are probably providing less insurance, and that goes back to Dilip's point, which is that if they're providing less insurance of a certain type, right, then that's going to then affect the demand for insurance. So if they're providing less aggregate insurance, then I'm going to be more willing to purchase aggregate property insurance, for example. Okay? Uh, and then uh, it's also the case on the other question about that, I forgot to ask it. It's also the case that most. Uh, most of uh, most of the help, the informal risk sharing type help that you get, is actually coming from within Jati, not outside Jati. Right? The Jati is a really important um, aspect, a uh, component of, of risk sharing. And then Nathia's point. So Nathia, we can. This is more of a methodological point. We can discuss offline. But we actually have in in the regression I just mentioned, we have Jati fixed effects in there. Okay, and the reason is uh, uh, the reason we can put in Jati fixed effects is that uh, it's. You know, we are looking at the interaction of a Jati characteristic and the shock happening. Uh, and so because it's identified off of interaction, you can put in the main term, the Jati fixed effect in there. So we can address a lot of the, a lot of the, uh, you know, sort of, you know, our Jatis have unobservably different characteristics. But there's a lot of other things we do for that, and I'll discuss that with you separately. Um, so, yeah, and reciprocity is definitely very important. So we see grants and loans going in both directions, uh, not one. Um, Ta -da, ta -da, ta -da. What else? A little bit of the uh, serial correlation question about the ah, sure, sure. So of course, serial correlation will affect demand, right? So in uh, if I if, if I know some something more about my environment for for a future year, that's going to affect my demand today and and and, and a future year, and that's fine. Uh, I, I don't think it actually um, uh, affects our. Uh, uh, Maybe think it up bilaterally. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, what else? And oh. then uh, I, I think there was a question about the network of people who are doing work on index insurance. Oh yeah, yeah but, I, but I covered I covered a lot of that. Yeah. Um, oh, aggregate output effects. Oh, yeah. and do we break even? Effects. Do we break even? Yeah. Um, so no, we don't break even because of the subsidy. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, yeah, and it, in terms of aggregate output effects, so we have actually collected both aggregate output as well as profits. So profits are very difficult to measure in the setting because costs are extremely complicated, where people are using some combination of, uh, you know, home labor, you know, their their friends helping out, and some of it's paid labor. Um, and so we have all that data, and we can we can look at the effect of insurance and risk taking on 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 output. Yeah. Oh, and cash crops. Um, so. We, Right. Um, so, so, so when when you actually look at you know when you collect data in environments like this, it's very difficult for you to, for us to characterize. Oh, this is an action that we can think of as riskier, right? And that's why we you know so the way we made progress on this question was for an environment where there is a single crop Tamil Nadu, right? So it was very you know uh, so as opposed to like. In a particular environment, switching from rice to wheat might be riskier or might be a response to risk. Right? It's, it's, it's really hard to it's really, really hard to figure things out because it depends on the rainfall conditions, etc. Right? So when it's only rice, there are different rice varieties. That's when we could characterize some rice varieties as riskier and some rice varieties as a high return. Right? And that's how we make progress. And the second thing is that farmers are taking a bunch of different actions. Uh, that all of which you know affects the risk environment and all of which affects their uh, sensitivity risk, and and that all shows up in how much your out how sensitive your output is to rainfall, right? And that's why we use that measure because that kind of aggregates across all those different decisions farmers are making, right? and that's a that's a standard way to measure like risk taking behavior in the literature. Okay. Thanks so much. Uh this is a great paper. I think we got a lot out of it. Uh, uh, I'll tell you, you know, the hardest thing for policymakers is to take a job what you've given us. There's so many questions that you can ask about whether the design of the study really answers these questions. Uh,
precisely enough for decisions to be made. So in this case, I mean, my immediate take would be I will encourage the insurance companies to do what you're doing, take the studies into, into the design of the contracts, and hopefully if you get enough number of insurance companies active and experimenting with different uh, contracts, and there's a pot of innovation money or otherwise available to support them in that effort, then hopefully if somebody gets it right, and designs the package right in one place, and then it works hopefully over time. Uh, because the alternative that we've done, which is uh, asking any time the, uh, the, the, the priority sector lending for agriculture and asking the banks to have an insurance component attached to it, it's compulsory. It's actually compulsory. Every farm loan in India has an insurance company. Unfortunately, the problem is we don't know what happens to that uh, recovery process, so we actually have to do ex post insurance in terms of uh, loan waivers and other things. So it's a very costly business, but more important from the technology side. I think there are different states and different jatis have different risk-taking characteristics as well. So whether for whatever cultural or other reason, we don't know. So the take-up rates now, the production is shifting. The rice, wheat from kind of, you know, from the north to the Tamil Nadu and the east. And so these are questions that are very, very crucial and important to us. So thank you for a wonderful paper. Look forward to more of the work. I think the audience gave you a lot of suggestions. Yeah. So, so uh, one, yeah. one, I should give some credit where, uh, in terms of innovation by insurance companies, we're talking about my partner here, uh, so under the company AICI. So they have been very uh, proactive in uh, being willing to partner with researchers and, uh, and, and take some of those risks uh, to, to innovate and learn. Uh, so Perfect. Perfect. Great.